Test is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Economic mm -hmm. Development Webinar Series. Uh, I hope you all had a fabulous summer, and I'm um, happy to be back uh, today without webcams, but I promise I'll come back in the future. My name is Susan Lowe. I'm with the Design Coordination and Outreach Branch of the Ministry of Jobs, Trade, and Technology, and I'm providing technical support for today's webinar and moderating the Q&A sessions. I'm located in Victoria, BC, on the unceded Coast Salish Territory of the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations. I'll be joined today by Steve Thompson, who will be our moderator for the panel. Steve, Steve hails from Fernie, which is in the traditional territory of the Tanaha Nation. We'll also be hearing from Rose Hoer from Nelson, which is the land of the Sinex Nation, and Jim Gibson, who's in Calgary, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy and the Suti. Sutina and Stony Nakoda First Nations. Uh, before we go any further, I'm going to review some housekeeping items for you who are perhaps new to the webinar platform. Uh, let's have a look at your tools for participation. So the orange arrow lets you shrink the panel, uh, the control panel to the side of the screen. Uh, it automatically shrinks to the side if you don't do anything for a while. Don't panic, we're still here. The orange microphone tells you that uh, you are muted. And when we start discussion, generally speaking, we're handling questions by having you write in to the enter a question for staff box. Uh, other times we may do discussion. Uh, so that's what that is for. The, the little gray box allows you to expand the whole webinar interface to the full screen and the little hand lets you raise your hand to show that you wanna speak. Uh, but as I said before, the best thing to do is put your question into the question box. Uh, finally, you've got two options for connecting to the audio for this webinar via your computer or by phoning in. So right now, uh, if you want to phone in, you can click on the little phone call button or radio button, and it'll give you a phone number that calls in with an access code for this webinar and a personal identification number for you individually. Uh, if you're connecting via the Instant Join web app, things look a little bit different. Uh, but it's the same principles, computer audio or phone call. Uh, the session is being recorded. Uh, the GoToWebinar platform captures the audio feed and the screen sharing. Uh, any questions that you type into the question box are saved as part of the session record, but not publicly. The presentation slides will be made available as well. So give us about a week after this session to get it all get it all together, and then you'll find it under the BC Ideas Exchange link in the webinars section on the economic development part of the website, uh, gov.bc.ca slash economic development. Okay, let's get moving. Uh, oh, before we go too much further, I, I have to put out a call for people to participate in our 2018 Local Economic Development in BC survey. Uh, my colleague Alex Ashernock sent out um, an email invitation to approximately 3,000 people through the province. We got 400 responses in 2016 when we did the survey and we were hoping we can beat that. The survey gives us an opportunity to learn about what each of you are doing in your communities and how economic development is structured, what you feel is effective, and also how we can design our tools and resources to be more helpful to you. And we're doing it in partnership with the Union of BC Municipalities. So uh, I will pop that uh, URL into your chat box very shortly, and you can click on it from there after the webinar, copy and paste it after the webinar, and uh, go and give us your knowledge. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Steve Thompson, who's been a big part of the popular Tech Dev 101 workshops that have been delivered throughout the province since March this year. Steve and his colleagues Beth Gallup and Cindy Pearson delivered the first of our Tech Dev 101 webinars in June. Uh, yes, you can watch that online. Uh, Steve is back to moderate a fascinating exploration of community building and culture in the context of a tech and innovation sector. Uh, Steve will introduce our other speakers, so I'm gonna hand it over to you now, Steve. Coming your way. Great, um, thank you, Susan, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? I think we can, yes. Okay. Great. Um, so as Susan mentioned, I'm Steve Thompson. I'm a principal consultant with uh, Capacity Consulting. Uh, we're here in Fernie, British Columbia. 
Um, and we've come here through a circular route uh, through the technology clusters of Waterloo, Toronto, and Vancouver. Um, I have a history as a technology product development uh, uh, manager, and our consulting practice is split between working with, directly with startups and working with or enabling organizations, whether that's governments, nonprofits, or social enterprises, uh, that work to build and support uh, technology ecosystems. As Susan mentioned, uh, since March of this year, we've been uh, traveling around the province doing one-day workshops with communities across the province uh, called Tech Dev 101, um, of which this uh, webinar is a component. If we haven't been to your community, uh, Susan will, I think, have some information at the end of this session on um, how to uh, uh, request that we come in and, and help you. Uh, today, we've got a couple of fabulous speakers who I could probably listen to all day, so I'll go quickly through um, a very quick contextual recap uh, so we can get into their content. Um, to start, I want to introduce uh, or remind you of um, a model that we've created for uh, developing technology strategies called the innovation ecosystem. Uh, it's something that I first crafted probably 10 years ago now um, out of frustration more than anything else having read and worked on various technology industry strategy documents, um, I have found these strategies often had many of the same components in them, yet they still failed to convey the interrelatedness and interdependentness uh, between the various elements. So common to most strategies are the following ingredients, access to capital, access to talent, access to markets, uh, the community's infrastructure, such as broadband access, regional airports, and a community and culture uh, that supports innovation and the willingness to take risk. These elements are typically bundled as four or five components with varying names for the elements that include streams, themes, thrusts, pipelines. Uh, all of us consultants have to call it something else uh, to you know, make it worth our, our uh, like we're doing something. Um, and to me, all of these names imparted a sense that the ingredients are discrete and that they're not interconnected. And I thought that this was a mistake that we were making. So in the innovation ecosystem, we call these components biomes, and these biomes work together to create uh, the complete ecosystem. The model, uh, uh, the inspiration for the model is BC's co uh, coastal temperate rainforest. And anyone who's walked through an old growth rainforest knows that they're very special places. You know, somehow even the air feels different um, in the rainforest. And the rainforest itself is comprised of several biomes, typically viewed as layers from the soil layer up to the understory layer, to the canopy layer, and finally to the emergent layer, which touches the sky hundreds of feet up. And independent to a degree, each biome teams with a wild variety of life forms, yet each layer works in concert with the other layers to create this unique and self-sustaining ecosystem. And the rainforest feels both wild and chaotic, yet at the same time, there's a very organized and predictable structure to it. And to me, this is what an economy thriving on technology and innovation should feel like. It should be an environment that's wild and chaotic with various forms of, of life forms and creations, yet with, as economic developers, this certain structure and predictability um, that in the background. And that's why we use the analogy of the rainforest uh, for the innovation ecosystem. Uh, the ecosystem consists of five biomes, uh, capital, talent, infrastructure and placemaking, uh, community and cultural support, and external connections. And as an ecosystem, our objective is to build it in balance. If we put too much focus on one part of the ecosystem or not enough focus on another part, we can bring the system out of balance and, and miss a lot of the results that we're trying to produce. Um, and you'll see that we've uh, designed the ecosystem in, in blocks. And um, for instance, uh, we've, we've broken out the capital biome into a number of smaller blocks that we've, in, and we've also added, in this case, you'll see a feedback loop or feedback loops. And feedback loops are incredibly important to the building of an ecosystem as we want to constantly reinvent uh, the capital and, uh, and, and experience that we're creating in our ecosystem into the next generation of technology companies, always building bigger and better, generating more exports, et cetera. So we're constantly reinventing ourselves, uh, but with an ever-increasing amplitude um, 
in our in our metrics. So because our industry is built on people, um, even more so than, than companies, an emphasis on the community biome is very important. And for municipalities and First Nations on today's call, the, in the absence of anything, um, the best place to start is with building your community and culture, and hence uh, the, the need for today's webinar. So in our strategies, you know, there's often a lot of focus on capital, on infrastructure, but it's important, you know, that we, but an important area that we often miss is culture. Um, and you want to get culture right from the start because it's a lot harder to change later on. And with that, I have the privilege of introducing you to Rose uh, Hoare. Uh, Rose is the community manager for the Nelson Technology Community, and she's the founder of the Nelson Innovation Center. And everywhere we go across the province with the workshops, everyone always asks us, what's happening in Nelson? And I always reply, well, Rose is happening in Nelson. Um, she's a great friend. Uh, she's an, got an amazing story to tell. And uh, I just wish we could clone her and, and bring her energy into every community across BC. So with that, Rose. I'm looking for, oh. Am I un unmuted? Yeah. Okay. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to sharing our story about the great things happening here in Nelson and we are where we are heading in our community. I think there's lots that other communities in BC can do to attract and support knowledge workers in your community. Nelson is definitely not unique, but we're it's unique, but it's not that unique. There are lots of um, attractive and livable communities across BC and across Canada. I'm not a public speaker, honestly. I'm not a trained economic development person. I've never held a title with the words economic development in it, but uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm someone who's very, very passionate about our community. And I'm someone whose Croatian roots mean that I just keep bulldozing through a problem until I get it done and I won't stop. <laughs> If you're looking uh, for a silver bullet or a shortcut today on how to build your community quickly, you won't hear one from me. What you will hear is that building your community is really a lot of work. For me, it's taken probably about three years. It's a lot of hard work. It's weekends, evenings, early mornings. It's whenever a tech entrepreneur um, comes to our area and feels they would like to meet with us. And when you get to the point where the things are happening and you're getting momentum as a community, you'll feel, you'll find that there's even more work to do. It's extremely rewarding. It's different work, but it's still work nonetheless. For instance, we have 36 jobs to fill this fall for two tech companies who are coming to Nelson. We need to help these companies find offices. We need to find these companies um, attract to att attract people to these companies and then we need to help those people find where to live housing we also need to support their spouses and their children and to become part of our community so now that i've scared almost everyone off the call today i look forward to lots of questions from three or four of you who are still left behind to hear us so let's proceed uh steve do you want to do the next slide Thank you. So a little, little bit about Nelson itself. I'm sure that most of you have heard about Nelson, but I'd like to share a little, a little bit about our, our community. To start, we're a lot more than just hippies and pot. This, um, we do have a unique culture. In a, few, in a few slides, we'll talk about the culture and the importance of finding a culture fit within the companies that we're building and attracting here. And as Steve mentioned earlier, Really, that's the key, is, is the culture component. Um, Nelson is a former mining town located in the West Kootenai region on an arm of the Kootenai Lake. Like most resource towns, um, we've had no shortage of ups and downs over the years. We're a very picturesque community of about 10,000 people. And because of our history, we have some tremendous um, and beautiful heritage homes and buildings that line the steep slopes. There are no bad in Nelson or at least that's what they say. 
Uh, we're the regional economic center for the West Kootenai. So we're the hub of something around 50 to 60,000 people in our area yeah, that live probably within an hour, an hour and a half of Nelson. We have a great and thriving downtown lined with historic buildings. We have is the envy of many as well as a music community. We have decent internet throughout our community. It can always be better. We have Shaw and Telus and a fiber loop through our downtown core to which businesses can connect. And we're literally in the middle of nowhere in southern BC, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. We're about eight hours drive to Vancouver, a similar uh, drive to Calgary, and about three hours to Spokane in, Spokane in the US. Unfortunately, our regional airport in Castlegar, which is about 30 minutes away from Nelson, does have a bit of a reputation as a difficult place to fly in and out of at times, which is challenging. We have a great ski resort, Whitewater, and we have just about every cultural and recreational pursuit that you can name, which is a huge attraction to many people. We're a place that's hard not to love. And if you lived here and had to move away for whatever reason, it's a place where you probably like to come back to. And that is something that we're capta capitalizing on very well. And we'll, we'll touch on that when we talk about our business attraction strategy in a few minutes. Lastly, we're the northern anchor of an emerging West Kootenai technology corridor that starts with Metal Tech Alley and anchor companies like Thought Exchange and Roslyn and Trail, which are about an hour and 15 minutes from Nelson, going through Castlegar. Uh, next slide, please. Steve? Thank you. Um, because Nelson is a great place to live, we've now actually attracted and retained technology knowledge workers over time. So like many livable BC communities, we have people living here and quietly doing their thing as either remote workers, lifestyle businesses, and some smaller growth focused technology companies. As a community, Nelson has had a few small technology companies come and go over the years, but unfortunately, not enough to create a, a true nucleus. <clears throat> and so we had an incidence of people here, but we didn't necessarily have a community, which is something that we're calling invisible tech. They are, therefore, our first job has to connect those people who already exist here into a community. With that community, we were then able to start adding value with traditional economic gardening tools, <clears throat> such as, for example, the Venture Acceleration Program, a bunch of co-work spaces, probably four or five, and building on the Nelson Innovation Center, which is our most current project. Once we had the community uh, pulling together, we were able to elevate the Nelson technology community above all of the noise that's out there. And so people were able to see what we were creating something unique here. Once we had the community pulled together, we had a story that we could tell investors and to people who were considering moving here. And we're seeing that. The emergence of our community largely of pulling together of what is already here um, has really helped to de-risk decisions for others looking at our community. It has helped de-risk decisions for people in the lower mainland or people in Europe or Asia who are considering moving their families here. It has helped de-risk investment decisions for people in interested in building housing or commercial space for a tech community. It has helped de-risk investment decisions for entrepreneurs considering creating companies or satellite operations here. On investment attraction, I should mention that the first wave of entrepreneurs that we are attracting are people who have literally, you know, some existing connection to Nelson and the Kootenays. Perhaps they were raised here and moved away for school or work. Perhaps they just visit here or they have a secondary home here. Whatever it is, our first investors wave uh, tends to already have some connection to the community and that has been key. We don't need to boil the ocean looking for technology companies to locate in Canada, in Nelson, sorry. We need to find the Nelsonites who have or have had technology oriented businesses elsewhere and are wanting to come home. This is important as we don't have deep pockets to go elephant hunting. We don't have 
um, generous tax breaks either, for that matter, that we can uh, give to companies to locate here. Uh, Steve, next slide, please. Thank you. This is my favorite topic. I get very passionate about this because this was the early beginnings of things. But bringing uh, the community really together is a lot of hard work. That's what everybody always asks me and say it's a lot of hard work and it requires the right people to do it, including a, a dedicated community manager. Uh, we all assume that in small towns, everybody knows everybody. So it's, it's pretty easy. But many of the people who work in tech or who do remote work are people who have literally like quietly moved to our communities and they are just quietly doing their work. Um, you may come across some of them, you know, with your children in different sports, playing hockey or at the chairlift. Um, but you're not sure what exactly they do and it's never been the source of your personal connection to them. So as a community builder, as a community connector, we need to make those connections more relevant to technology, innovation, or knowledge work um, in order to create that, the community that we seek, which is where, for us, really, the tech meetups, uh, monthly tech meetups, have been extremely successful, and we have been able to pull people. Um, so for me, the community con connection process is a three or four phase process. Uh, first, you find a people who are already in your community that's really really important like to build it out from a grassroots uh, movement is really the best way to go the second one is to help strengthen the connections between those people like introductions you know the tech meetups that take place from one month to the next a lot of people i find in tech are you know very busy doing their work and tend to be sometimes introverted so making those connections is really important whether they're just networking or meeting other tech people or you know, pulling them together to do contracts so that they can bid for bigger contracts locally in our area has been extremely successful, actually. Uh, third, bringing those people together on a regular basis. That is so, so important. Um, and the last one is encourage the people um, to also meet on their own, like outside of the, the group meeting to engage in some of those uh, conversations. And um, a good place to also start Start is with traditional asset ma mapping. So it's identifying the companies and resources that are already, you know, in your community, uh, with an emphasis um, on the people within those organizations. So companies really they come and go, but what you want companies, the community is more about the people in the companies than it is in the companies themselves, because they will stay probably within the community. Um, the companies themselves might relocate once they get bigger or they need to move. You might have a company where, where the entrepreneur is happy being a lifestyle business and not wanting to grow beyond its current size, which is totally fine. That's why we choose lifestyle sometimes living in some of these places. But within that uh, company, you might have a technologist who wants to have a great growth startup. And that's the person we want to put our energy into to help build some of those um, tech companies. Okay, Steve, next, oh, sorry. Um, one more thing that's really important and my favorite topic also is um, when it comes to identifying people, the tactic that I did that people always ask me uh, that I really love to share and and, and uh, they love other people love to tell about what I do is my coffee shop approach so every time I was in a coffee shop I would spot someone working within their laptop and I would ask them hi are you in tech and they say yes yeah. how do you know I say well you have a laptop and would you like to come to our tech meetups and that was sort of the early beginnings of trying to gather some of these people together so that uh, we could have a very vibrant uh, tech community. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the business attraction piece um, starts with finding entrepreneurs who already have some form of affinity for your community. Maybe they grew up here but moved away or they have a secondary residence here or maybe they just come um, 
for for a ski week every winter like that's totally possible or they come fishing or something whatever it is uh, these are great targets these entrepreneurs already understand your community and its strength strengths and weaknesses you know all the issues you might have with within your own community their investment decisions are more likely to be driven by personal and emo emotional drivers rather than the matrix sought by you know the usual site selectors we might not be attractive to them and most importantly they are likely to be a good cultural fit for your community they've already come from here they understand the way we live and once you get these entrepreneurs on the hook this is really where the really really hard work starts because now you have to land them here because now you have to settle them into your community and this is where I'm at right now currently with some great companies and it's why I am actually crazy busy all the time as I alluded to earlier we have an exciting uh, announcement from a company coming very soon to our area so watch for it I can't announce it announce it yet but we will soon and we're looking for 36 jobs this fall for just two of our companies Next slide, please. This is the investment required. So um, lastly, I just uh, talk quickly about the kind of investment your community needs to make. You need a community manager or a community developer, someone whose role it is to ensure the community gets built. Like that's just so, so very important that the community events are happening like all the time, not just randomly. They need to be very specific. You need economic gardening tools specific to technology and knowledge work. You need the infrastructure required to support this community. You know, you need good broadband connection. You need regional airport connections. You need available and appropriate housing. And you need support for their families once they, they, knew, they move here. Uh, they, um, you need office space, commercial space for them and their needs. And you need to have this, the sizzle that makes people want to live and work in your community, which is beyond just building their companies here. They're interested in you know, good schools for their children. They're interested in what sort of recreational activities are available for their families and things. And for their you know, potential employees, like it's a very, very holistic approach to, to building out uh, a very successful tech community. Thank you so much. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thanks, Rose. Uh, so I'm just going to remind our audience that if you'd like to ask questions for Rose, uh, you can enter them into that send a question to staff box and uh, we'll set them up. You can also save your questions and if something comes up and you'd like to ask it, excuse me, towards the end, then we'll have time at the end, I hope, as well. Um, we have a couple of polls. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Uh, so we're just going to um, do a couple of pop quizzes here just to get uh, a sense of who we have and uh, um, what kind of communities you come for. These will pop up on your screen in just a moment. And if you can take a moment, uh, if you're... Uh, multitasking, come back over to the webinar and answer what size of community do you represent? So what kind of, what size of community are you working in uh, to do economic development work? I'll keep the question open until we've got at least 75% voter turnout because I do love to see a good high voter turnout. And I believe we'll probably have some more questions after this. There's a couple of questions coming in for Rose. We'll just finish up this poll first. Multitasking on my end here. All right, so we're still collecting responses. Gonna leave it open for a couple more seconds here. If you haven't voted yet, I can see only 66% of the people on the webinar have voted. Uh, so give that a shot. Ah, excellent. Those last few people came in. All right, I'm going to close the poll and share the results so you guys can also see who, what kind of communities are on the call. So we've got actually a really interesting mix of community sizes, um, quite diverse. 
So it means we have people throughout BC. We've got 15% on the call. Um, oh, and there's just over, just uh, there's 38 attendees on the call right now, not including our guests, the, the organizer and the presenters. We don't get to vote. So this is on the attendees only. So 15% under 1,000 population, 15%. Uh, and in 1,000 to 5,000, 26%, 5 to 15,000, 19%, 15 to 50,000, and 26% over 50,000. So that's uh, a, a really broad range. So I'm going to hide this, and then we've got a couple of questions for Rose that have come in. Uh, Rose, oh, who do you work for? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I do some contract work for the Nelson area, Nelson area economic development forum to build out this tech technology sector. But I do mostly consulting work for various um, various technology projects. Okay, so you work for everyone. You work for <laughs> the whole community. I work for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what type of support did you receive from the municipality? I, I, I received a lot of support from uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the City of Nelson, uh, the Community Futures, uh, lots of, uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurs within our area, um, lots of just local people, lots of parents and families and people just wanting to see this uh, sector grow because we, we wanted to have good, good jobs and we wanted to be able to have people stay home and not have to leave our area uh, because the good jobs weren't here. Okay. So is lots there, of support, lots of lots of support. So do you have a um, sort of a hub organization that, you know, is a nonprofit or has a board of directors or anything like that? Is there like a... Well, uh, my original, yeah, I originally started uh, a contract with the Kootenai Association for Science and Technology known as CAST. And I was uh, responsible for running the Venture Acceleration Program. And so they were the key for our area for, you know, anything sort of tech entrepreneur and venture acceleration. And within that uh, contract, I realized that there were a lot of uh, people within our area. And it was very funny. And my boss at the time, I, I said, well, where are these people? And she said, well, you have to go shake the bushes and go and find them. And I thought, okay, well, that's what I'm going to do. So that's how I ended up sort of recognizing the fact that we actually do have a tech sector. It was a matter of pulling them all together. It really did start with CAST. Okay. Uh, did you have any resistance from community members as you were building buy-in for your initiative? or And, and what strategies did you use uh, to, to get the buy-in if there was resistance? I did get it. I did uh, have have some resistance at first because I think people thought we were bringing in Amazon to our area and they were really kind of scared what it was going to turn into. But I, I, I quickly realized that, you know, what we were really doing was we were building uh, the assets that were in our community, which was, you know, we wanted to support um, technology folks that already lived here. You know, we brought up Startup Nelson, we brought up uh, Canada Learning Code, and there was training for our local, um, you know, our local folks here. And then when they started realizing that, we, you know, the companies that we were attracting to come here were mostly born and raised Kootenai people um, that really wanted to, they were very successful outside of our area, elsewhere in Europe and in Vancouver in particular, two entrepreneurs I'm thinking of. And they just wanted to come back home. They wanted to raise their families here. And so once, you know, they started seeing that it was really fit to the culture of Nelson, they, that they embraced it a lot more. Interesting. Okay. Um, and how successful have you been in identifying housing for workers? Um, well, we have a very strong uh, Facebook page called Attack the Knowledge Workers. We probably about have 700 people on that. Uh, and we've been able to, as a community, pull together for that housing piece. People have um, come forward and, you know, offered uh, their rooms and their, their investment, pro you know, houses that they might have. And so we've been managing to do that quite well just within our own network. Oh, cool. Okay, great. 
Thank you very much. And there, if there's more questions for Rose at the end, the, they'll come up. And uh, if we don't get time for them, then I can always yeah, pass them on. You can let me know when you ask your question, if it's okay for me to give Rose your, your information, if you want to connect with her or have her connect with you. She seems to be, I would say, a person good at connecting. That seems to be a talent, Rose. <laughs> Thank you very much <laughs> for sharing that with Thank us. You. Thank All you right. very much. I'm going to turn it back much. to Steve now to introduce our next speaker. Steve, you got yourself muted, I think. Oh, no, there we go. There we go. There. Um, so, so thank you, Susan. Uh, next up, we have got uh, Jim Gibson. Um, Jim is a seasoned technology entrepreneur and technology executive from Calgary. Um, he's also the author of a new book called Tip of the Spear, where he talks a lot about uh, the intersection of the impacts of technology and society. And he's one of the co-founders of a fascinating technology movement in Alberta called Rainforest Alberta. Uh, while Jim is working with a larger city and larger cities um, uh, and with established technology ecosystems, um, he'll share a bit about why community and culture was an important place for Rainforest Alberta to focus their efforts. So with that, Jim. All right, Jim. Good morning, everybody. Sending you the presenter controls. Good. Good morning, everybody. Thanks. Thanks very much, Steve, and and all for having me. Um, what I'd like to do is is walk through the, the the experience that we've had over the last couple of years in an, in an amazing social experiment that you know to echo some of Rose's comments about, about driving economic change and innovation through the grassroots and understanding what that looks like and feels like and and so forth i've been i've been just blessed by uh, a, a, a group of people that have been extraordinary in, in this journey so what i'd like to do is just walk you through our experience and just again as calgary is a larger community steve had asked me to make sure that that i look at some of the common themes that that are expressed in the movement that we are that that are really universally applicable and and i think i think having reflected on this for the last couple of years um i think i think there's some common themes and and i'll circle back to some of rose's excellent points on, on community building which i think are, are resonant in in what we've done in calgary so just some context in in how we got started um steve mentioned his consulting group's approach to um, looking at metaphors of rainforest, um, we chose the an actual book called The Rainforest, um, which came out of uh, a group in in Silicon Valley, uh, Greg Horowitz and Victor Wang, who I've had the pleasure of meeting, and they're just amazing people. Greg Horowitz is actually a biologist by by training and an observer of ecosystems generally, um, and then specifically around technology and. And, you know, the urban legend in Calgary goes that our assistant deputy minister of innovation had, had bumped into this book at some point in time in late 2015, or early 2016. And, and it's an extraordinary read on complex adaptive systems and, 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 and why we need to pay attention to nature to teach us about what it is that uh, systems of, of innovation need to do. And, and so our assistant deputy minister, Justin Reimer, uh, read this book, um, bumped into one of probably Calgary's leading keystones in innovation, Brad Zumwalt. So Brad is a serial entrepreneur, successful uh, on many, many fronts, and also a social entrepreneur, gives back in many, many ways. So one of the keystones of the Calgary innovation community and he read the book as well, and Brad and I are, are longtime colleagues, and he passed it to me. Long story short, we ended up reading this book, and, and we said, this is something that Calgary needs. And, and the challenge in Calgary, as most of you can imagine, is as a technology ecosystem and a diversification ecosystem, we're in the shadow of a single commodity and a very successful trillion dollar energy industry and so diversification while always top of mind has rarely been able to be executed at the scale that we need it and so in this latest downturn um, the technology and innovation folks like myself and brad and a number of others really were lamenting that 
that we 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 were not acting as a as a single tribe and with a single voice and so the rainforest gave us a voice and a and a methodology to talk about ecosystem building and so you know the, the, there's a long story to it but basically in the summer of 2016 we reached out to the original authors of the book and the consulting group that had formed we raised capital privately so this was all on a private initiative and we brought the authors and 65 people from the ecosystem of Alberta together in Banff um, and in a privately funded uh, symposium asked the fundamental question, what's, what is it about the rainforest concept that works for us and what are the gaps in our ecosystem? And, and it was an extraordinary serendipitous event of, of government people, entrepreneurs, venture capital folks, and just people we knew as, as people and they came together in this amazing session in, in, in September of 2016, and was just thrilled to be a part of this. And so the long, the, what happened was we just simply started to meet. We created something which I'll talk about a little bit more called something called the social contract. And since that time, we've had over 2,100 people from the premier to the mayor to um, somebody just recently unemployed to all range of people in our ecosystem that signed the social contract. We've met 102 weeks in a row since that time, every Wednesday, something called Lunch Without a Lunch, where we get 90 people every week from all walks of life, um, 30 plus or minus new every week. So we're touching parts of our ecosystem that we can't imagine. We've kicked off and supported 10 major initiatives from education to space to um, uh, a, a range of things. We've held subsequently, we've had six immersion sessions following that first one in both Calgary and, and Edmonton. And then we're, and, and we're measuring our ecosystem progress. And, and we'll talk more about this um, in a couple of weeks on the seminar, but uh, we've moved our, our ecosystem innovation score from an F, 50, 540 out of, out of 1,000, to 650 in, in our measurement. So we're slowly making progress um, in a measurable way um, towards success. So um, as a private entrepreneur, I'm a venture capitalist. I've built and sold six companies and, and, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a true participant in this economy. What, what really got me was the fundamental equation of the Rainforest book was this concept of, of, of building trust. And so the message of the book was very, very simple. Um, and there's a, it's, a, it's a rich read, it's very complex. But at the end of the day, if there was one message that the book delivered to all of us in Calgary and, Edmund, and, and, and Alberta, was that innovation as a concept, the ability to move forward quickly was natural in a culture of trust. And, and so, you have to be very careful when you use words like this because it feels very squishy and touchy-feely and, and so forth. But we were able to demonstrate in our weekly meetings and our immersion sessions, actual progress and significant velocity change in our innovation system because human beings had signed a social contract. We looked each other in the eye and said, um, I haven't met you, I don't know you, but I, I, will, I will start with, a, with, with the openness of trust. And that was a very powerful change in attitudes and behaviors because previously what we had found was that in a, in a world of scarcity, our innovation ecosystem was scarce resources. There was, there was only so much to go around. Most of our talent and energy and capital was going to the energy sector. In, in, a, in, in a world of scarcity, trust is the first thing that disappears. And we had to break that down if we were gonna move. And, and, that, and, and the, the, the subsequent message of the book was, as you start to build a network of human beings who simply um, are able to relate to each other in a coherent, calm social contract, you build connections exponentially. And what that, what that does is that as you watch people start to make a connection from Bob to Sally and Sally to Fred, um, and the indirect and direct connections between human beings, um, that trust enables very magical things to happen, including capital to flow, talent to be acquired, um, 
space to be uh, given, people to pay it forward, and so on and so forth. So while the concept is super simple, its impact is actually an exponential effect in a network. And, and so with that, the book taught us something else was that, and the reason why we called it a rainforest, and Steve knows this very well given his, his vision, is that complex adaptive systems like an ecosystem of, of innovation are really just, are really analogous to biological systems. And the famous economist, you know, Albrecht basically said it, that, that all living systems and economic systems are very similar. And so with that kind of concept, we, we, we took it to heart that we needed to think uh, not in terms of tax policy and venture capital policy, but we really had to understand the principles of what we call complex adaptive systems. And in fact, Rose is talking exactly about that as she was talking about her, her experience. She didn't call it complex adaptive systems. She, she called it, um, you know, making Nelson come alive. And, 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 but all of the words that she used, she could have written the book on, on the rainforest. It's exactly what they say. And so the number one evidence of, of, this complex adaptive system is this thing called the social contract. And I've just excerpted, ex, ex, excerpted, I've taken the very opening paragraph from our social contract. And it's, a, it's, it's quite tongue in cheek in the sense that it, it, it feels like a bit of a rap music. But as it, as it says, we are an inclusive, silo busting, sector agnostic, all industry, open source, ego shrinking, weak ecosystem building, entrepreneur focused, wide open, social barriers, fashion community. We say that and, and people laugh, but, but, and we included all of those words because we wanted to, to A, be as inclusive as possible, but we also didn't want to take ourselves so serious that, 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 that we, we couldn't find ways to, to share, you know, uniqueness about all of us. And so it was a very powerful moment when we wrote this social contract and it and in the book you if you get a chance to read it you'll see that one of their number one deliverables of the rainforest approach is to create this social contract and and it just looks like this and and uh, i'll never forget we we met in the september of 2016 and then two weeks afterwards we got a group of our 65 we got probably 15 of us in the room and within 10 days we had written this explicit social contract that talked about the very principles of how we needed to behave. And, it, and, and, and what we've learned since is that in, in a world of scarcity where there's competition and win-lose, there's, there's a breakdown of in, the implicit contract of how we really want to behave. And by making it, making it explicit, writing it down, making people sign it physically, not digitally, physically sign it with a pen and paper. We really changed the narrative. We changed the way people behaved. And, and I can tell you that I was in dozens of meetings in the subsequent six months and the last year where people would call each other out respectfully and, and with, without passion, but call people out on, you know, are you really listening? Are you being truthful? Um, or, or have you thought of diversity as, as uh, uh, from, from the get-go. And so this social contract played a huge role in, in us being able to um, simply say to our network that we were behaving in a way that, you, that was trustworthy. And if you remember from the beginning, trust was the key to that. And so this social contract has gone all over the place. I actually had been working out of London, England. I brought the contract and, and gave it to the head of, head of um, sustainable development for Barclays Bank, um, who is looking at global thoughts around changing their behavior at the bank. And they are starting to use this. And I've, I've taken this all over the place. And it's a, it's a, it's a very powerful tool. And I'll just, I'll just conclude with, with just um, really a reiteration of what, of what Steve had said at the beginning. Her, his firm has a methodology. This is a similar methodology. This is right out of the book. But the point of of, of this slide is to really emphasize the, the weighting in a true ecosystem between culture and leadership and the rest of the things we often think about as, as elements of our innovation ecosystem, policy, tax, infrastructure, role, all of those things that we normally assume. And so in the, 
in this picture, it's a reminder that culture and leaders, as the rainforest people talk about, is 50% of the battle. And we, we assign that to the word sustainability. In the absence of a culture of trust and of social contracts and leaders, you can't sustain the velocity. You can get it started, you can get everybody excited and all of that, but you can't sustain it. If you want to increase the velocity and capacity, those are the other elements of it. But in the absence of those two things, none of this can happen. And we've learned that time and time again over the last two years, and it's been very powerful. And I encourage everybody here to, to probably a, more importantly, is to respect that culture change and people's behavior takes time. It's not something that's prescriptive. It actually takes the time for human beings to be in the same room, to share ideas and stories and, and move those forward. So I encourage you to, to, as Rose had indicated, that those meetups and those places where people can connect are extremely important to sustain a long-term innovation culture um, versus trying to fast track it through artificial means such as the introduction of, of, of new capital ideas or, you know, you know when, when Calgary went to go and try and uh, uh, bring in Amazon, we were really, really nervous because that was the exact economic development wrong approach, which didn't allow for fertile soil to grow. Amazon would have come to Calgary and absorbed all of the work and changed the culture of our very, very fragile and nascent ecosystem. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. And I really appreciate being able to have a chance to share the, the Calgary story. Um, we are uh, at rainforestab.ca, our Twitter handle is Rainforest AB. Um, I'm also very active in the space given my writings and the work. So there's there's my stuff. We just published a very interesting blog post with myself and Greg Horowitz, who is the original author of the Rainforest book. It's about an hour long um, blog post on really the genesis of this story and where Greg talks about other global examples of, of Rainforest. So I'm really delighted to be a part of this and, and uh, Look forward to any questions that you may have. Thanks very much, Jim. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch a second poll, which will give people a chance to vote and then think about questions for you. So it'll be coming up on your screen. Which of the following most closely reflects your community's stage of technology community development? So as it's coming up, if you've got questions for Jim about the rainforest social contract, uh, feel free to add those in. Or, hey, he gave you his Twitter handle, so you can tweet him as well. I found it really interesting to go and, and look at the social contract. Um, being in Victoria, of course, we've got a, a very robust and energetic tech sector. And there's a lot of gatherings and stuff like that, but I don't think I've actually seen something like this, which makes it um, particularly explicit that that the culture is at the heart of things. So I really appreciate Jim bringing this to our discussion here. So, all right, we've had the poll open for a minute. Um, Jim, I think people are just really impressed with you. We don't have questions for you right now, but uh, they, they do know how to get a hold of you. Um, so here are the poll results. I'm hoping you guys can see this because for some reason it disappeared uh, from my screen. Uh, audience view, let's see what we've got. Yes, you're seeing it. Okay, great. Uh, so for many of you, uh, you are thinking about thinking about developing or planning to plan your develop uh, your technology community strategies or currently developing your plan, and then 9% uh, actively assisting and attracting businesses. Uh, oh, and we have some questions coming in. Yay, I knew I could count on you guys. Uh, here's a question for you, Jim. Uh, if trust builds community exponentially, does a break in trust destroy it exponentially as well? Um, super good question. Um, what, what we found is it's not as fragile as that. Um, um, what happens is, is the behaviors that are recognized in the social contract are, are, off, are used to bring kind of that, that virus, if you will. So, so if somebody breaks trust, 
what happens is, is that the people are comfortable and trustworthy to call it out in a respectful way. So well, we, we, we haven't seen the explicit major breach, breaches of trust. But we have seen areas where people haven't been as open or as forthcoming as we felt was necessary. And people call it out, right? They call it out again, respectfully. And, the, and what happens in networks is that it kind of self-selects. If, if people don't fundamentally agree or, or believe in the principles of the social contract, they just kind of disappear. They don't become involved in the ecosystem. And, and so people who are looking for soul, solely their advantage and, and trying to create a win-lose situation just, just simply don't gravitate. But what's happening in Calgary is that the majority of those who are doing really interesting, profitable, and exciting work are kind of members of this, this, this tribe, if you will. And uh, so it self-selects. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, someone has asked, uh, it would be helpful to know if anyone else from my community is on the session. That way we can uh, continue the conversation locally. And uh, Tom, I know that I know where you're from and I'm drawing a complete blank on it because I know we've talked about things. But if you can just send a message back to me, then I can call it out. I feel really embarrassed right now that I don't know about it. I'm going to carry on. Uh, we've got some announcements uh, of upcoming things. Uh, I'm also going to unmute Steve in case he's got anything he wants to add just at the end here. Steve, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, I just want to thank again our, our speakers for joining us today. Um, I, both have been or are extremely busy and I know it's it's always one of those cases that when you need something done, ask somebody who's busy uh, because they're the kind of people that do it. And, and I think you've seen that with, with Jim and Rose. So um, a big thank you. Um, I can't say enough about, uh, you know, the, the Rainforest Alberta and, and the con social contract, of course, being uh, located here in southern BC, uh, southeastern BC, uh, we're very tied uh, economically to Calgary. Um, uh, Jim alluded to, to Brad and we consider him a Californian because he does um, spend some time uh, in, in, here in Fernie or the Fernie area. Um, but uh, yeah, again, just generally, um, the social contract is a is a fabulous tool, and I know after I read it and and saw the this emphasis on getting out of the zero sum game mentality that if I if if uh, I win, you have to lose, um, and vice versa, and getting into a community where you're like we all have to pull together, um, I think is incredibly valuable. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. And thanks to Rose as well. I'm just going to go through some upcoming things we have because if you're interested yep. in this uh, this technology development thing, you're going to love these upcoming webinars. So September 27th, that's next Thursday, we'll be joined by Colleen McCormick and Yvonne Rincon from Network BC. They're going to talk about how a small community can develop a compelling business case in support of investments and connectivity. Uh, that's the sort of business case that's going to help draw support from government and private sector partners. We've been talking about this, and I'm very excited because they're tying together economic development and connectivity with the broader scope of community sustainability. And then on October Steve, uh, October 3rd, Steve will be back with us for more Tech Dev 101 exploration. And this time he'll be bringing two experts on benchmarking, Robert Bell of the Intelligent Communities Forum, and Nelson is an intelligent community, and uh, Joe Sterling from Rainforest Strategies. Uh, he'll, they will together be looking at some different methods for benchmarking or measuring your community's progress on tech and innovation related indicators. And they're also going to talk about how to avoid some mishaps or missteps with benchmarking. Uh, there's lots more webinars scheduled for the rest of the fall. Um, I will be sending out uh, invites to these upcoming webinars uh, to everybody who's um, registered on this webinar. And also I have a a big long list. So if you've been seeing stuff from me already, you're probably going to get some more. But just if you want to make sure you're on it, um, you can go to this email list, sign up. Uh, unfortunately, you, you can't click the link, but it's really easy to copy down. So cm.pn slash 3inj. You can sign up there and make sure you don't miss any of the announcements. Also, add uh, the economic development at gov.bc.ca to your safe senders list if you're external to government. 
And you can also go, I'm just going to go back up here. You can go to our gov.bc.ca slash economic development site. Uh, under BC Ideas Exchanges, where you'll find the webinar section, and that has all of the upcoming webinars, as well as you can look at our past webinars. You can go back to June and watch the first Tech Dev 101 webinar, and you can also look at what's coming up this fall. So, uh, and you can get links there to register for things. And once you've registered, you will get uh, the invitations and the reminders from GoToWebinar. So after this webinar is complete, you'll get, uh, there will be a pop-up survey, so please complete that. It'll also get sent to you in your email just to give you another shot at it. And um, it's 11 o'clock. Uh, Tom Bulmer is in Vanderhoof, so if anyone in that direction and wants to get together with him, you can reach out to him through Community Futures. And uh, thank you very much uh, to the presenters and to all of you for joining us and for, to Steve for hosting. Uh, we will, oh, I'm just going to check there. Oh, uh, right, Steve, you were going to mention something else that's happening in the Fraser uh, Valley. Yep, just a quick mention for anybody who's in the Fraser Valley um, this week on Thursday, September 20th, is the second annual Fraser Valley Regional Tech Forum uh, taking place in Mission at the Best Western Plus. Um, and uh, um, uh, probably the best thing is just uh, Google uh, Fraser Valley Tech. Uh, Tech Forum 2018. Great. Thank you, Steve. That's another way for people to get together and build their tech communities. Uh, without further ado, I'll just, uh, I'll end our webinar. Thanks, everyone, and see you next time. Thank you.